Welcome, Professor and uh, little investigator uh, Asker Mortensen to this uh, Dias seminar. And I'm uh, Jonas Biermann from the SDU Nano Optics Center. And Asker recently moved to SDU. Previously he was uh, at DTU uh, last six years as a full professor. Uh, but just after moving to SDU he he even uh, received this uh, 40 million uh, Danish Krona grant from the Willem Foundation and now is Willem investigator and uh, Asker already has uh, more than 230 uh, peer-reviewed international uh, papers and uh, H-index 44 <laughs> and uh, impressive it's um, six 6,300 citations already and uh, I was had to look at the CV so just the, the last five years he, he, he did uh, co-author 90 papers and uh, I'm not sure that's good or bad <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very <laughs> impressive so and now uh, so the research of Professor Asker Mortensen is, is very broad but it's uh, quantum optics and it's, uh, Plasmonics, it's uh, metamaterials, uh, graphene plasmonics, and I'm sure now uh, Asker will tell us much more about this uh, light matter interactions on nanoscale. So, please. Thank you, Jonas. Thank you. Yeah, so I've been uh, looking very much forward to, to this event. Uh, let me just make a few remarks in, uh, in relation to what Jonas already said. Uh, the order of events was that I accepted uh, the call to become a professor here, and then afterwards I was informed by Willem Foundation that they were actually happy to support me in the next six years. And that's actually the order of events, even though old friends at DTU like to think it was otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of the things I will show you today is of course uh, the things that have been coming out of my research group at DTU. Uh, but it's uh, stuff that we are trying to continue here. Uh, and uh, I decided not to try to cover everything, but rather zoom in on a particular aspect, and that's the exploration of plasma plasmonic nanostructures and their optical properties, uh, not equipped with optical microscopes, but rather using electrons. Uh, that might not seem kind of obvious why you have to do that, but I will try to kind of guide you through that. Um, so if you want to already now have some kind of structure in, in mind, you could imagine like a dimer formed by two small metallic nanoparticles that we expose to light. Uh, of course, the metals here, they contain free electrons that you can now set in oscillation with this incident light field. And uh, if you want to have a size in mind, then this could be as small as as 5, 10 nanometers this particle. And it also means that if you think about the optical cross-section of, of this object, yeah, it's not really that big, and that's really the problem. We like to explore those tiny objects. <coughs> the most obvious thing would be to put them in an optical microscope, excite the, the collective oscillations of electrons in this with a light field. But you wouldn't really see much, and that's why I'm turning now to exciting those collective oscillations, not with light, but with electrons. So you could say, well, let me just briefly say a little about the center. So uh, somehow, uh, Sally and I have, uh, have uh, almost married now. Uh, <laughs> and that's kind of unusual in the sense that you have two strong professors in, 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 in one center. Uh, but we complement each other quite well. Uh, Sally already had a long for a long time uh, established uh, international leading activities, especially on the experimental part of, of, of plasmonics. Uh, and uh, you could say what I bring now is also the, the theory expertise in this. And, and so somehow this, this fits very nicely together. And, uh, and uh, that's also very unique, actually. And I think I can proudly say that this is one of the leading environments now for exploring uh, what I call plasmonics, <coughs> like the science and technology associated with how light interacts with free electrons in, in small pieces of metal. It's 
very much basic research that we are conducting, and uh, that we could only do, we can only do because we are generously supported by both the European Research Council and now more recently by the Genome Foundation. And it's kind of, it fits, it fits very nicely with the idea of DS because all they want us to do is to do curiosity-driven research into to this topic here. Uh, they just expect me to do something excellent. Uh, and in fact, they even encourage me so, to, to, to maybe even rethink if this is really what I like to do or if I would do something else. But you probably got the same message. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's um, really rare these days that you get this opportunity. And I'm of course humbled <coughs> that I'm given this opportunity. Okay, so here's a brief outline of what I could have done. You could say, why? why bother about light matter interactions of nanoscale systems. I should give some kind of introduction for that. Uh, why not simply explore those kind of optical phenomena with a light microscope? And you could ask, how would electron microscopy be possible? <coughs> now, I decided that this is maybe not the order I want to go. I will rather try to do something I haven't done before, give you more like a chronological approach to this, taking you back to the first invention of the microscope and then go step by step. So I will, uh, I will uh, show you one of the first microscopes. I will discuss how we can, of course, think about light as a wave phenomena and how that, of course, also limits the possibilities of what we can do with those microscopes. I will uh, discuss something called particle wave duality in, in quantum mechanics, which actually allows you to rethink what a microscope could be and what kind of waves you could use in the microscope. It allows you to actually do the same things you can do with optical microscopy, but now sending in not waves of photons, but waves of electrons. Uh, I will show you how that was historically leading to the first observations of what I call plasma, this collective oscillation of electrons in conducting the lightness. Uh, and then uh, I will give you the more modern version of this, uh, how this is looking if you go now to, to metallic nanostructures. Uh, and then finally, let me get back to why we are so kind of excited about this field, where this could potentially be. Uh, so I hope I have time for this. So here you have Robert Hooke, this uh, handsome gentleman who, uh, there are no photos of this guy, of course, but somebody made this this painting. Uh, he is actually quite a genius, and he uh, he kind of published the first book where you find something that looked like a microscope. Uh, it's called micro micrographia, and uh, and basically he he show he devised how to how to make a microscope that can image like small insects. So look at when he did that. So it's it's actually before Maxwell. So there was no real theory how this was working. He was probably thinking about light in a, in a ray picture, right? Uh, and of course, that picture doesn't help you appreciate how small objects you would eventually be able to see. Um, uh, I like this guy for other reasons. I also see him as the pioneer of what you call linear response theory. It's predating uh, all the mathematical developments by Taylor, Taylor series, etc. And uh, of course you know what he did, it's called Hooke's Law, it's the mechanical displacement force. If you take a spring and pull it away from equilibrium, the force that pulls you back <coughs> was named after this guy. Right? So he didn't do a Taylor expansion and you know, stopped after first order, but, but it's really one of the first examples of linear response theory, which is infiltrated, infiltrating of course all, all science and engineering and, and probably beyond, I guess. Uh, in economics, you also think about first order derivatives, etc. Right? So, <coughs> Mr. Hook. Uh, and then later came in uh, Maxwell, of course, uh, teaching us that light is really, you can think about that as an electromagnetic wave phenomenon. You can attribute a wavelength to this. And that, of course, has to fit now with, with the idea of a microscope. And basically, uh, one of the contemporary persons was Ernst Karl Appel in, in Jena, in, in Germany, 
who was uh, actually at that time the chief uh, technical officer. I'm sure they didn't use these kind of labels that those days for Carl Zeiss company. So he was the kind of the right hand of Carl Zeiss, and he was really responsible for all the wonderful developments of microscope that we benefit from today. But he was smart. He, he started to think about, you know, how small things can you see in a microscope? And the fact that the light fields are waves, of course, means that it's difficult to resolve something that is much more than the wavelength of the wave you're sending in. And if you like in more technical terms, you have this diffraction limit. So it means that on, on this scale, you can easily see kind of larger objects. But if you work with visible light, there is some kind of cut here. And beyond or below this, I should say, you cannot really observe the, the structure, the details of the structure. And some of my systems, they are also belonging in, in, in this size regime here. And that's why we have to turn to other kind of uh, techniques to really explore what's going on in the near field of those uh, metallic nanostructures. Right? Okay. So uh, I have to find some other ways with an even shorter wavelength so that I can push this limit you know, further down. Uh, so let me stop here with this guy, Louis de Broglie. He was uh, quite a bold guy at that time. He kind of more or less suggested that if you had a particle, it could also have wave properties. Imagine the kind of resistance this must, must have met at that time. Uh, it also has this consequence, of course, if you accept, except you have light waves, you can start to think of in terms of light particles, photons. So it works both ways. Uh, but he more or less attributed now an effective wavelength to, to, to a particle which has a momentum uh, P, and H is H bar. Uh, so if you think about massive particles were moving with a certain kinetic energy, you can also attribute now a wavelength to this. And if you if you accelerate the particles more and more, give them higher and higher kinetic energy, the wavelength is becoming shorter and shorter. So it seems to to do the job I like I like to have done, right? I mean I like to push this smaller and smaller so that I push the diffraction limit to to smaller scales. Uh, okay, so the, the, the basically the key experiment that can prove that for instance electrons actually also behave as waves is to, to do some kind of experiment you would normally do with waves. And so why not do like an interference experiment where you send in now beams of particles on, in this case, a, a double slit. Uh, and then you look at what happens to, to those particles on the other side. The behaviors waves, you expect, of course, some kind of interference pattern. So this is standard material in, in textbooks uh, on quantum mechanics. But it's not so often you see what actually happens. And so here I'm just showing one kind of experiment. If you put now a detector on the other side and you start lo looking for what happens on, on this detector, uh, and you stop after, say, an, a finite number of electrons, then it doesn't look that encouraging. Right? <laughs> uh, so it, it looks like a shot noise. or You know, you're, you, you can count the 28 electrons until where they hit the detector. <clears throat> but then you go on for a while, and, uh, and you start to see this interference pattern forming, and eventually you see it very clearly. So of course, so I'm not going in, in those details, but, but of course the quantum mechanics and the attribu attribution of a wave to this is, is more related to the statistical properties of this, this problem. But nevertheless, this is the proof that if you now have a flux of many electrons coming in here, then you can think in, uh, in, uh, in terms of, 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 of waves as well. Uh, so this actually led somehow, so normally you say, well, quantum mechanics is fine, but what are the implications on our daily life? It led, so, okay, let me show this. I like this, this picture here. It's a, I don't know who the artist actually is, but uh, you see it starts being, being particles up here, and you have waves down here, and I think at least it's one illustration of this duality. <coughs> now, this, this uh, particle wave duality actually uh, led people to think in terms of microscopes, and if you could make uh, microscopes operating on, on beams of electrons that are guided through these kind of uh, electron optics. So you do more or less the same as you do in a conventional microscope, and, and uh, 
it actually works. Uh, the take home point here is that since the wavelength depends on the energy, you can just accelerate the electrons to high and higher energies, you get smaller and smaller wavelengths. And so you can focus this to smaller and smaller spots. So of course there's no diffraction limit, but, but you can easily, or easily I shouldn't say, but you can, you can, you can accelerate them to 100 kilo electron volt and then you start to enter the atomic regime where you can, you can resolve things on the length scale of atoms. So imagine the revolution this has created in material science, etc. Uh, so during the lunch break, I just checked the announcement from, uh, from Stockholm. It turns out that the price in chemistry actually went for further uh, use of electron microscopes. In this case, they are, well, you can read here yourself. You can also look now at solutions of biomolecules if you, if you do it in a cryogenic environment. So it, it keeps being very active research field and it's also being recognized even in Stockholm. Okay, but uh, you have to read more on this, it's, it's brand new. Okay, so let me show you how a, a state-of-the-art microscope uh, looks like uh, these days. So, <coughs> uh, some years before, uh, Mass McKinney Muller unfortunately passed away. He was visiting the GTU campus and he was, so he was walking around like this. He, uh, he announced that he would like to have a visit, but he didn't really tell what, what his agenda was. And then, uh, at some point, he stops and says, I would like to spend some money. <laughs> And uh, well then, of course, he has full attention. <laughs> At the end, he said, I'd like to spend like 100 million things from on the condition that uh, whatever you do with this, uh, you have to be fast because I'm getting old and I want to see this inaccurated before I might pass away. Uh, so clever people sat down and decided that they should uh, create a center for electron nanoscopy where they would put a full range of different electron microscopes into this building. And one of them, it's a state-of-the-art FEI Titan uh, transmission electron microscope. So more or less the one that Ruska uh, uh, came up with but, but brought up to, to, to modern standards. And it's equipped with something that we call electron energy loss spectroscopy that we are using uh, directly in our research. And I will tell more about that. But of course this facility is key to, to really doing much of this research. And uh, fortunately, I still have access to this this facility because it's not something you just move here. Right? And it's uh, well, I didn't even bother to ask uh, our president for money for such an instrument, <laughs> but maybe I should have done. <laughs> uh, but uh, we will uh, we will uh, we will install some complementary equipment here this year. Uh, so this is just giving you one feeling for what you can actually see with such an instrument. So it, it's a substrate with with silver. Uh, metal nanoparticles. Uh, at first this might not look so impressive to you, but look at the length scale here. Uh, so this is like 5 nanometers, so some of them are only of the order 2-3 nanometers in size. Uh, so definitely they are invisible to the naked eye. I wouldn't uh, gain much by putting them in the optical microscope. Uh, on the other hand, they are still containing hundreds to thousands of atoms. Uh, you might say, well, uh, why didn't you bring a, a decent picture? It looks uh, quite noisy. Uh, actually, uh, the noise is not really noise, but uh, it's, it's actually indications of the individual at atomic columns in, in those particles. Uh, so we didn't push this to, to the extreme in terms of resolution, but you already start to see that, that with this, high energy, which is like 100 kilo electron volt, you, you start to be able to, to enter this, the world of atoms with those instruments. Uh, so by the way, uh, this building doesn't look so impressive, but there's much more under, underneath. Otherwise you cannot have the atomic resolution. So you could say you just dig a big hole and then you start putting money into this. <laughs> Right, so those are some of the, the particles I like to explore. I like to explore what happens when I expose them to light or if I excite them now with beam of electrons. Uh, so let me talk a little about what, what plasmons are. So uh, we work with metals, which oh, so not all the funds came through, but anyway. Uh, we work with, with metals which contain uh, a gas of free electrons. That's of course why, why they can conduct a current, right? So it could be 
copper, it could be silver, it could be gold, any, any metal would, 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 would work fine. Now this gas of electrons can of course be put into some oscillation. Right? It's a little like if you have now a gas of atoms, you can have pressure waves. So you hear the pressure waves leaving my, my, my loudspeaker here, right? And it's reaching your ear, right? Uh, and like in the same way, I can have pressure waves propagating in this gas of electrons in a piece of metal. And that's called a plasma. Uh, it's of a longitudinal nature and it's characterized by a, a plasma frequency which contains the density of electrons that you have in your system. So this frequency depends on, so it's different from metal to metal. Uh, you can also have another kind of excitation. So here I'm showing it for, for finite nanostructure. In this case, it's a dimer. Uh, the gray kind of cloud here is this cloud of electron that I'm now displacing from my, my, my equilibrium position. So of course, I like to sit and screen all the positive charges of the background of this metal. So in total, it's charge neutral, of course. But imagine you displace this electron gas back and forth, then you have an oscillation. And Coulomb forces will try to pull it back, so it's well, you can start to write up something that start from Hooke's law, actually, right? You get a harmonic oscillator with a restoring force, so that's the resonance frequency. For this. Now, this is the classical picture where I treat this gas as a rigid body, so it's just moving back and forth, but I cannot, it's not being compressed uh, in, the, in this picture here. And that's some of the things we are very interested in to, to look beyond this kind of rigid body description. Yeah. And that's where you enter, you need to make like a quantum description of, of, of the metal to account for the finite compressibility of this electron gas. So there are some quantum aspects that will eventually enter, and we are right now curious what will they do and, and when will they actually matter. Uh, <clears throat> You can see this phenomenon in a large number of material systems. So, so we are mainly working with noble metals, but you can also think about semiconductors which you dope so that you have a finite number of carriers. You could even go to some of the new low dimensional materials, nanotubes, graphene, etc. And if you come from the other side, you could even start to think about macromolecules if you now dope them so that they have a finite number of, of electrons in addition to, to those just making the molecule neutral then you can probably also set those electrons in some kind of oscillation and, and people are kind of calling this molecular plasmonics. I'm not really sure it's kind of controversial, but there are some, some of those effects even in macromolecules. Okay, so now you know the basics of what a plasmon is and it's these kind of oscillations I like to probe. Uh, it's clear that if I come in with a light field here, then the, uh, the light field has an electrical field in it, right? So that will act on, uh, on, on charts, uh, charges, right? So that's enough to actually set this oscillation in motion. But I could also come with a beam of electrons, and that would, of course, try to kind of squeeze the electrons of the metal away. So that's another way to also excite those kind of oscillations. Uh, this woman, I actually think we should add her to some of our posters. Uh, she's very important to both math and, and physics and engineering. Um, so Amy Noether, she figured out that conservation laws in physics, they relate very much to symmetry properties of, of, of the problem. Uh, and the one I just want to emphasize here is that if you have somehow time invariant, so if you look like a continuous flux of light of, of, or electrons coming in, and so I can start it now, I can start it five minutes later, but it doesn't matter if you have this time invariance then it also implies that in your system you have conservation of energy. So that's, that's of course a principle that we are often kind of taught at least in physics and engineering, but it, where it actually comes from is, is from these kind of symmetry uh, considerations. And there are same things for, for momentum conservation, etc. But energy conservation is important for what I will show you now. I will uh, basically sketch here how you can now do what I call electron energy loss spectroscopy. So the principle is that you send in a beam with a certain energy here, so you accelerate electrons to a certain energy, and then you look at the other side, you look at the electrons coming out on the other side, and then you decide what kind of energy do they have. And of course, because of this energy conservation, all the, the processes where you just scatter elastically on, on this kind of medium you have here, 
uh, you have the same energy on the other side. Uh, so in a spectrum where you have the, the lost energy, so the energy difference between the stuff entering and, and leaving, you have a big peak at zero. It's all the boring electrons, right? And nothing really happens. Either because they just pass through <coughs> without interacting with my sample, or because they kind of were scattered by some structure in the sample, but really it didn't change their energy. So that's sitting here, and it's the most of the electrons that, that just appear in this part of the spectrum. So not every electron will interact with my nanostructure, it's only a few of them. The cross section is not so big. Uh, that's called the zero loss peak. Uh, uh, then, of course, you could also have a situation where some of them actually, so the electron comes in with, say, 100 kilo electron volt and it leaves with, with 95. So, right? so it has lost energy somehow. And, uh, and the lost energy is, in my case, uh, taken up by the excitation of a plasma. So that's the, the measurement principle. I use energy conservation. Whatever is missing is attributed to the excitation of some internal degrees of freedom in my system. Uh, in this case, it's this kind of small tiny peak here, right? And, and I think I should even say this is how it looks on a good day. The trouble is that many of those small things you like to measure is sitting on the shoulder of this big zero loss peak. Yeah. So you hardly see it. You have to have a very strong belief, right? <laughs> or do some, uh, some serious data processing to see this. And that's, of course, also where it's becoming, I mean, you have to know what you're doing, what you're looking for. Uh, now, if it was only like this, it would be awesome, but there are all kind of other processes also. And they all serve to broaden this zero loss peak, etc. cetera. So, uh, and uh, there can even be at very high energies, you can start to see transitions that, that are associated with the more uh, transition of, of strongly bound electrons in, in the atom. So I'm not really interested in, in this up here, but that can be used to actually decide what kind of atoms are we, we looking at. Uh, but I will focus on the low energy part here down, say, from zero up to five electron volts. Okay, so uh, it took a while before that was being used. I mean, there was uh, theory discussions by, by, by Pines who, who, who suggested that if you have now a piece of, of metal supporting this gas of electrons, then there could be these collective oscillations where all electrons are oscillating back and forth in phase with each other. Uh, but it was only, and there were, there were some experiments done with this uh, uh, yields, but it was only when Richie, he actually sat down and, and did some careful uh, analysis of data that he, he realized, indeed, what we see in those experiments are the excitation of such plasma. So this is very much considered the key paper. And you see, for a long time, there was, of course, some fundamental interest in this. But it was only more recently, say, in, in, in the past uh, 10, 20 years, that this took off with the new kind of developments of, of metallic nanostructures made possible with the developments in nanotechnology, that this really took off. So it became kind of a standard paper in this field. Uh, so unfortunately, he passed away this summer. But, uh, is a major figure in, in this field. I'm not sure he ever attended many conferences, etc. But, <coughs> but he, he did absolutely critical work back in the, in, in the, in the 50s. Okay, so this is how the structures look these days that we try to explore with this technique. And, and I hope you get a feeling for, for how small length scales we are actually uh, now uh, manipulating and where we also have to kind of resolve now the, the optical near fields. This is work from my friend Bert Hecht in Würzburg, where they have uh, metallic nanoparticles brought together with some self-assembly process. This is showing a close-up. Uh, basically, you have a gap from one particle to across uh, a gap here, separating the two particles, which is only like one nanometer. You even see the individual atoms. You have perfectly atomically flat interfaces, etc. And this is where you would kind of like to analyze your data with classical electrodynamics, and it's not really obvious that this is a, a good approach or how good it would actually be. And that's part of, major part of my research to actually figure out how far will classical descriptions uh, work and when do we have to start to account for the quantum mechanical aspects of this, 
this system. And since you start to see the atoms, it's of course an indication that one should expect classical approaches to fail eventually. So I'm not going to go in detail with that, but there are some surprises in that. Uh, this is another piece of work from, uh, from, uh, from Singapore, uh, Joe Yang, who, who fabricated, in this case, it's bow tie uh, antennas, but with small gaps here, only a few nanometers across. Uh, and this is work coming out of, of Sergei Bajivalny's lab while, uh, before I entered and, and also from a collaboration where we have metal surfaces where we, we make these very deep narrow trenches uh, in the metal. And down here you only have, it cannot really resolve with this picture, but you should imagine you only have a few nanometers from one surface to the other. Uh, so it's these kind of structures that also call for special techniques if you really want to see what happens in the near field of this. I can of course shine light with my, with my laser and I can look in the far field what are the consequences. Uh, there might not be much response but I could still tell something. But if I really want to understand what happens in the near field, I, I need these kind of new, more advanced techniques. Um, this is a small diagram actually telling you what you could expect by working with different optical and, uh, and electron-based techniques. Uh, basically, you have here the spatial resolution of, of your probe, and down here you have the energy you would be able to excite if we talk about, say, plasmons. Uh, the two dashed lines are the diffraction limits of, of optics, and if you work now with electrons with this kind of typical energy that we are using. Uh, <laughs> so definitely, I mean, there are things we cannot resolve, but since this dashed line is much suppressed, you see with, with this electron energy loss spectroscopy working uh, with a few electron volts, you can almost get to the resolution where you say, well, now I can start to see atoms, right, or groups of atoms. Uh, so this is what we will do, and uh, here's my first kind of example of of early research with this. So it's not really that extreme, the, 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 the wire, but it's still uh, much smaller than what you would be able to resolve in a, with a microscope. You should think about this as a wire now supporting these, these free electrons. You can, you can make this soup of electrons oscillate in different ways. And um, so this is something you probably all experienced. Uh, if you have it in a mechanical system like a string, you fix one end of the string, you start vibrating the other, and if you do it with the right frequency, you can form these kind of standing waves. If you haven't done this, go home and do it. Nobody <laughs> will make fun of you. It's a great experience. You can do it with your kids or grandchildren. Don't mind them. But it's exactly the same physics I like to explore now with electrons inside this wire here. So I put it on a substrate, I stick it into my, my electron microscope, I crank up the energy so that I get the good spatial resolution, so I have roughly 100 kilo electron volts, and then I try to figure out how much energy I lose to the excitation of those, those waves. Now the beauty of this is, of course, that you expect to see this, but I guess uh, you should always do the experiment. Right? This is how we, we learn new things. Either it confirms our line of thinking or you, you learn something new. We shouldn't just rely on solving Maxwell's equation and deciding this is probably like this, it's good for me, I don't need to see what it's like in the real world. So we, we went there and this is what you see. Uh, how many of you think this looks like, a, like some numerical simulation? Now there is at least one confessing over there. Right? <laughs> uh, it's real measurements, guys. This is what you can actually see once you start to analyze your data. And you can see the different standing waves. Uh, you have more and more nodes here, etc. Right? It's exactly this physics that I anticipated with my mechanical system. Uh, with this, we can even now measure what is now the wavelength of this. So we can decide what the energy is. We can figure out all those dispersion relations for the plasma. Uh, we don't have to rely on, on solving equations, you can, you can simply go and measure here. You can even get new information about what happens at the ends of this wire that is difficult to figure out if you just try to, to, to do the theory for this. Okay, so it's to a large extent confirming what we, we kind of expected. 
uh, let me shift gears to a structure that is much more advanced. Uh, it's one of those groups, so imagine a big piece of metal with a groove written in it. Uh, you would like to send now a beam of electrons down this kind of valley, right? And that's of course easy because the electrons, they move on a straight line. And uh, you would like to think of course I can just uh, write a, a straight valley. Uh, that's not how it is if you turn to the nanoscale. This will be uh, like a, a curvy line. And uh, so if you want to pass an electron through, you should, you should take now a slice of this material. So I have, have this material, I have the line, and now with some approach I try to cut a very thin slice of this. Once I have the slice, I stick it into my electron microscope, and then I can pass an electron beam uh, down, down this valley here. Uh, so Tobias Hongor, who was a postdoc in Aalborg, he, he actually did that. When I say slice, it's really a thin slice. It's like 150 nanometers. So imagine how fragile this, this is. So you, as you're smiling, you were closer to this experiment. But, but it's, it's really not easy. Uh, so you slice it, then you find a way to get it from Aalborg to DTU without breaking this. <laughs> And then you stick it into the microscope, and then you do this experiment where you're, you're passing now electron beams through at different positions. And since you only have a thin slice, you can actually go pretty deep in this trench here. And basically we are mapping here how the plasma energy, so I'm not going in detail, but basically it depends on where you probe this now. So you can really, the very high spatial resolution, both image the structure, but also image what happens to the plasmas in this, this system. Uh, so this is giving you some kind of perspective of what you can actually do with those techniques. I should say that this is not going to replace optical spectroscopy. If you can get away with just measuring with optics, you should do that. <laughs> this, is, this is really a nightmare. But, but it can be done, and it can give additional information. And one of the key things you get access to is, is all of plasmas that you don't probe with light. So light will only excite, if you like, oscillations which have a dipole moment. It has to put positive charges somewhere and negative charges somewhere else. And then this you can excite with a plane wave that comes in. But if you have other kind of arrangements, you can, for symmetry reasons, be in a situation where you don't see things with light. Now that doesn't mean that those those solutions don't exist in my problem. So in general, think about a, a situation where you have an, a number of different solutions, eigenstates in this problem, right? And what you actually do is you probe a superposition of them. And light only selects certain of them. That's called the bright states. But with electron beams, you can get access to all the, the dark components as well, those that don't respond to light. And for our research in quantum plasmonics, this is super, super interesting, actually, because we don't excite this, those structures with light from outside, but rather you could imagine I want to put a quantum emitter now here, yeah. some small kind of quantum system that can emit light. And that can actually probe all these other, other superpositions of my eigenstates as well. So if I have some very lossy solutions that I don't see with light, then it doesn't mean that they are not important. They would actually be a drain for energy if you think in terms of putting meters in the nuclear or so <coughs> Right, this is another experiment we did recently uh, with my former student, Sam uh, in collaboration with Stanford. We decided uh, to look into the wave guiding properties of, say, very uh, narrow trenches uh, written in a, in a film of metal. <clears throat> so it's plasmas that could, say, exist at the visible or slightly longer uh, wavelengths. And still, you can squeeze it into these kind of narrow trenches, which are, in this case, only like 25 nanometers across. So you can, you can put this optical energy into plasmas that occupy this tiny space, even though they have energies matching, uh, say, visible light. And so what we showed in this experiment was, again, if we now probe those plasmas with beams of electrons, we can see how, how the, the light here can go around corners. You can even kind of cross these kind of junctions. So this is becoming like building blocks for, 
circuitry, not for electrons flowing around, but for light flowing around and those links gates. Uh, and that was picked up by, for instance, Ingenieur, and so I think they got a little carried away because they <laughs> even mentioned this could lead to super fast quantum computers. I, I'm not really sure, but I would be excited to learn how. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let me now turn to silver nanoparticles. So this is, of course, an arc system crushing, but imagine you have some substrate, you have bought some kind of fairly cheap solution of particles that come with many sizes. Uh, if you would excite this with light, you would just probe the average properties of all the particles. If I do it with an electron beam, I can actually put myself on a particular particle without probing labels, right? So I can visit one after the other, I can figure out what are the properties of plasmons, and how would it depend on size? Now, the classical expectation is that it doesn't depend on size, so I'm not going into the, to the explanation why it's so, but the classical theory says as long as they are much smaller than the wavelength, the resonance frequency doesn't depend on size. Uh, so we did the experiment, and uh, here you see some of the, the particles, uh, the smallest ones are down to 5 nanometer. Uh, so we basically visit one after the other. We use the electron beam to figure out what is the size of the particle, the geometry, but we also used it to measure the plasma energy. And classically you would expect that such a silver nanoparticle has a, a plasma frequency around three electron volts. And that's also what we record for the biggest ones. So that's, that's all in accordance with, say, solving Maxwell's equation using a semi-classical theory for how electrons respond to light. Uh, but then the surprise was that when going to smaller and smaller particles, uh, you leave this kind of constant uh, line and then you start to see a few shifting. So it takes considerably more energy to excite now the plasma. And this is the indication, of course, that, that the classical theory fails. You have to kind of repair it to account for more, I mean, properties of the electrons. Uh, I think to the fact that that this gas is not a rigid body, but it can actually be compressed slightly. Uh, so we saw this kind of additional blue shifting, and that has been attributed uh, by others as well to, to be related to quantum physics of, of the electrons inside those particles. Uh, even though the experiment is difficult, you see large arrow bars, etc. I mean, we don't have very good energy resolution. Uh, it's still, I mean, clear that the shift is much exceeding uh, all the uncertainties. Uh, so this is an example of the very fundamental insight you can get out of, of those instruments if you'd like to apply them to, to this problem. Uh, we wanted to go further, I mean, so this is probably the smallest part, and we wanted to go to even smaller part. Imagine that I come in now with a beam of electrons which have, each electron has an energy of more than 100 kilo electron volts. And this is a gigantic energy, at least in my, my world. And of course it's, it's putting you at risk that, that this particle mm -hmm. is no longer there when you look at, look at it afterwards, right? It's simply being kicked away by this electron. So if you want to kind of study even smaller particles, you have to make sure that they, they stick somehow. And the way you can make them stick is to put them inside a membrane. So you might still damage the particle, but it will, will not. I mean, you can go back and see if the particle is there after probing, and it, and it is. Right? So here the, 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 the balance is that you like to to choose a membrane that is thick enough to mechanically support this particle, but still thin enough that the electron beam can pass through. And furthermore, we wanted to make sure that this membrane was acting as if it was an infinite medium. So we like to explore now symmetry properties of this particle. Uh, so it shouldn't be influenced by the fact that I have broken this kind of symmetry at, at the surface. Uh, so it should be thick enough, and uh, somehow we found the sweet spot, and if you now do the experiment, you can see, of course, the, the plasma resonance that I've already discussed, so that would correspond to, let me go back to this slide here, that would correspond to exciting this kind of mode here, so a fundamental mode. What we are interested in now is higher order modes as well, and that we can actually see in our experiments. 
by carefully positioning our electron beam, we can even see a band of, of high order resonances as well. So we try, uh, decided to map out those, and here you really see this idea that what the electron beam does is that it excites not a particular eigenstate, but a superposition of eigenstates. So depending on where I put myself, I can excite different superpositions. If I'm far outside, I predominantly excite this fundamental resonance. If I'm deep inside, I excite this kind of bulk resonance, which is the one you also experience in a large piece of metal. And somewhere in between, there's a nice a sweet spot where you can even see these kind of higher order resonances. And we decided to map out those. So this is the fundamental <coughs> one I had in my previous slide. It's fulfilling classical theory, and then it's blue shifting when you go to the smallest particles. And the same actually occurs for the higher <coughs> order ones. And they even they are even damped, so there are some additional <coughs> losses also kicking in when you go to very small systems. So this is all in quite good accordance with, with some of the theory that was developed in my field, but I think it's still key to be able to perform the experiment and see that actually nature is behaving according to uh, It's only at that point that you are kind of completed the survey. Okay, let me just finally mention a few other things you could do. Uh, so there are different instruments being emphasized here. So this is the experiment you have seen so far. I come in with electrons, they interact with the sample. I look at what comes out on the other side. Uh, there are some other, other kind of options. It turns out you can also come in now with a beam of electrons. And it's not only electrons leaving, but that could also, if you excite the plasma, it could decay again and then emit a photon. <clears throat> so it's like a combined experiment now. You both have the electrons and you have the photons in the problem. Uh, the nice thing is that you have, because of the very small de Broglie wavelengths of the electron beam, you can focus this electron beam to very tiny spots. So that gives you the good spatial resolution. Uh, we don't have very good energy resolution when, when they're looking at the electrons leaving. Uh, what we do have in optics is good spectrometers that can measure the energy of a photon with very high precision. So if you now make a principle where you excite with electrons but you detect the, the photons leaving, then you have both a good spatial resolution and the good energy resolution. It's quite remarkable if you can now measure with spatial resolution which is like one nanometer and we can easily measure the energy with the same kind of resolution. Uh, so that's one of the things that Willem is now allowing me to install such an instrument here at SDU, and we will do so during the fall, I hope. Uh, another option is that you, you do this in kind of reverse. You excite with light, and you detect the electrons coming out. And that's even more kind of uh, challenging. It gives you this possibility that you can also now come with a pulsed laser here, so you can do time result measurements. You can see how those electrons are kind of uh, wobbling around. And uh, let me show you one experiment of that. So it's coming out of the groups in Germany where they have this kind of instrument and where they can really now resolve how how those waves are bunching around in those kind of bilia, uh geometries like here. And you can do it with a femtosecond uh, time resolution or even beyond. So they can make movies of those electrons now flushing around in, in the metallic nanostructure. Uh, what we will do is to implement this kind of cathodal luminescent thing where you now you, you drive uh, the plasmons with the beams of electrons, but you detect it by looking at the photons coming out when those plasmons are decaying into light. Uh, and I'm having great, having great hopes for this because it can deal, say, with this dimer with a very small gap inside and we will be able to probe uh, all the way down to two dimensions where you only have like a few nanometers across and where we expect uh, corrections to classical electrodynamics. Okay, let me just finally say why we are investing so heavily in those techniques. Uh, the next step in, in, in this and many other areas is to explore the quantum aspects of, of the dynamics. And uh, it's an area where EU and Europe is investing massively. So the, we already have flagships, the BRAIN flagship and one on graphene. Now there's one coming in quantum technologies where they are investing 
up to like 1 billion euros over the next 10 years. Uh, I'm not sure really how to count this and if they operate with some rules and things like that. <laughs> so there might be some rough on in this calculation. <coughs> but but it gives you the scale for, for the investments that will be made. In addition to this, uh, light technologies, photonics is of course uh, already one of the key enabling technologies in our daily life. You might not think about that, but all optical communication with lights and lasers and photonics, etc. And it's clear that there's some, some kind of overlapping uh, interest here. Uh, you could start to think about quantum aspects of, of all those uh, things. And that's exactly where we are, we are now tapping in. Uh, and one thing we are, we, are, we, are, we are speculating about is, of course, what happens now. We, we turn both to, both to smaller structures where, you, if you say, you start to explore quantum properties of the materials. And we also turn to situations where it's not like a laser with a, with a bunch of many photons coming out, but it's rather only few, few photons leaving my light source. It could be all the way to, to kind of emitting a single photon. Uh, so if you, if you walk up there in this direction, uh, then you could think about a situation where it's both the light and the material exhibiting quantum mechanics. Uh, by the way, I have a, a small story. So this first version of this, this sticker was made with a new pillar, right? And uh, so Sarah and I, we, we are so keen on going to few photons and, uh, and small structures. So the arrow was pointing down here. <laughs> and, and Peter was saying, no, it won't work. I mean, you have to go this way, right? <laughs> if you want to market this to anybody. Uh, so we, we actually listened to your advice, Peter. Um, so what we are really exploring now is the engineering of extreme light matter interaction. We like to use our nanostructures, our control over materials, uh, what you have on this axis, to really trigger very strong interactions of, of the light with this, this material. And uh, that's about making, say, these small antennas and going to smaller and smaller structures. Uh, on the other hand, we know that the quantum aspects of the material will kick in and limit how much you can enhance the light matter interaction. So there are some fundamental limitations we like to, to understand. And if you think in terms of more, more of the technology, we like, for instance, to make a single photon <coughs> emission from quantum emitters that are controlled to the extent that we can really encourage this emitter to only emit, say, one photon at a time that can be used for further information processing. You could, of course, say, why, you know, more, more, more photons sounds better, right? But there are some new aspects coming with, a, with a having only one, one photon and the photon being really now a quantum object. So there are completely new things you can do in terms of information processing and also secure communication, etc. Uh, that relies on the realization of such sources. Uh, so this is a recent paper from Sebastian in our group, uh, really showing how you can, uh, you can control the light emission from such a quantum emitter. Uh, <coughs> The emission might not be that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that frequent if you do nothing to this, but you, if you put it now in the near vicinity of such a, an antenna, an optical antenna, you can encourage this emitter to emit at, at higher uh, rate, etc. Right? So it gives you actually control on, on how and when you get this, this kind of photon emitted. Uh, and that has a number of applications in, 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 in different areas I've just listed. So if you're interested in this and what plasmonics can do for that, Sergey wrote a, a commentary this summer where, where it's really pinpointed how the control over plasmonic nanostructures is, is making some uh, new critical uh, things possible uh, in this area. All right, so let me just uh, acknowledge the guys who kind of contributed to all this. So. Uh, to thank many people, but in particular, I'd like to emphasize my former student, Søren Rath, who is now a young faculty at DTU. He started this uh, together with me and Nicolas Stenger, who was a postdoc at that time. And basically, I think it created a, a new paradigm for what you can do in terms of electron uh, 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 microscopy applied to plasmonic nanostructures, and, and that was also recognized by the European Physical Society. So awarded his uh, thesis for, for fundamental contributions in, in this area. Uh, it wouldn't be possible without generous support from both Willem Fund and Bernard Swamp Fund and 
to pay for who's for it. Uh, so with this, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to have your questions. question I'm from Fabian's group so my physics knowledge is from things. <coughs> but I found it super fascinating that here it seems like uh, on nanoscale waves all types of waves interact with each other so like you use electrons to you have this nice picture where you saw light around the silver the nano silver string so are is there a difference between an electron wave and a light wave on a, on a nano scale uh, do they all interact with each other? Because if we look around, like without a microscope, photons interact with matter. Now electrons interact with matter. Is there a difference? What does it change? So if you make now a, a classical description of that, then it doesn't depend on the scale that you're actually looking at. Um, and that's, of course, also our curiosity. You know, once you start to probe those kind of things at shorter and shorter length scales, where you eventually see something that is different from what you expected growing up in this kind of microscopic classical world, right? And some of the things that you can definitely do is, is if you go now back to Amy uh, I didn't discuss the other line so much, but uh, this other line here, so we are so used to dealing with large structures where we are happily, without thinking too much about it, uh, assuming that you have translational invariants. We don't conceal the fact that this, even this piece of metal is finite, right? It's big on the scale of the wavelength of whatever you, you're sending in. But now we're trying to actually probe structures which are on the same scale as the wavelength, right? And that means we are breaking translational symmetry, meaning that momentum doesn't have to be conserved, so we can take, get access to a number of other processes that you normally don't see. Uh, that you already experience with light, but we, we see it even more clearly when, when also coming with electron beams. Um, you all you also start to see other things, like I, I mentioned that you can have two kind of plasmas in the system. You can have things that oscillate like a pressure wave, sound wave, longitudinal waves. Mm -hmm. uh, normally, with light, you don't see those, uh, because mm -hmm. light is a transverse wave. So it, even without looking at the math, it, it, it sounds, of course, plausible that, that a mm -hmm. transverse wave wouldn't talk to a longitudinal wave. Mm -hmm. That's not true, actually. And when you look in, the, mm -hmm. in, in nanoscale structures, there is some conversion at the surface from the transverse excitation to longitudinal oscillations inside. That's another example where you start to, to see things being different. Mm -hmm. But if it's really fundamentally different, I, I cannot... Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, as we last question, there'll be further opportunity upstairs. Actually, <laughs> just in a moment. <laughs> But uh, before going there, thank you so much. It uh, will uh, be good for my throat. Here's for your throat. <laughs> and uh, here's for running around. Uh, awesome. <laughs> and it's a big size. Uh, <laughs> so uh, thank you so much.